Hello, I'm Mark Gibbons, and uh, I'm the uh, current Poet Laureate of Montana. I was uh, asked to take that position in August, and uh, one of the things that I thought that I would uh, do in the next year or two that I have here is try to, try to record as many people as I can, any po Montana poets, poets here in Montana, and, uh, and archive them. And so I'm going to start that whole thing. Uh, last week you saw me talking with Kim Anderson and Joel Baird, uh, and I read a couple of poems, but I thought that I would just take this time to just read sort of a sampling of my own work. And, uh, and then next week we'll start with poets, friends of mine, and other poets that I maybe don't know quite so familiarly across the state. And uh, so you can check in to MCAT as often as you want and, uh, and listen to poetry, whatever you want to hear. Uh, I thought I'd uh, start, uh, this is the, the, the latest uh, collection that, uh, of poems that I have out and it was done by Drum Lumman Institute in Helena. There's one right here in the beginning of this thing that sort of, uh, oh, it kind of takes a tour of, uh, of where I've been, uh, or at least what I do poetically and uh, and it's a Montana poem, I think, because it was written by a poet in Montana. It's called 406. We were Parkway 2, 3304, lived below the tracks at the bottom of the hill, flushed our toilet into the river. We were white bread rising behind the wood stove, coal shoveled from a pickup truck bed through the shed shoot door. We were carrots, potatoes, and beets in sand, stored in the root cellar, dug into the bank, canning jars of fruit and pickles lined the shelves. We were bamboo rods and wicker creels, rubber packs, overshoes, wool, and more wool. We were dandelion, chokecherry, and elderberry wine, kicked up by raisins, hand-paddled ice cream, a thick scum on the tongue. Comic books read on the floor behind the bar at Chadwick and Boyd's or in the back seat of our 55 Chevy. We were empty pop bottles traded for penny candy at Archie's Texaco, cleared our throats with ice-cold nickel bottles of Coke pulled from the water bath reservoir machine outside Johnny's Mobile. We were black bears, spring and fall in the fruit trees and garbage cans, the smell of wet dog, burn barrels, and deer tallow. We were clothes-pinned playing cards sputtering on bike spokes, like evil Knievel jumping knapweed, sleeping out in pup tents up the creek or on our lawns under the stars. We were strip poker and dirty jokes, a six-pack of Olympia beer stolen from Lovely's porch and stashed in their woodpile. We were sledding the big hill all the way to the river, bucking bales each summer till football began, cruising the drag and listening to the radio, Elvis, the Beatles, the Beach Boys and the Stones, the Doors and Dylan, CCR, Motown, what's going on, what's going down on the eve of destruction. We were the young awakening to men dying unarmed in the streets and bleeding overseas, deep in the jungle of TV. Goddamn, Steppenwolf set the tone as we tried to navigate, not lose ourselves on that magic carpet ride, or succumb to the pusher who'd become our generation, a monster born to be wild. We were the children of booming promise, gone shaggy, irreverent, and fucking stoned. How could this happen out in the sticks at the drive-in? Easy Rider kept us grooving. Marijuana was a weed. 
and we believed Jefferson Airplane's volunteers and canned heat's decree that all men, every boy, girl, woman, and man, were created equal. Black Panthers now took aim at Vietnam veterans against the war. It was insane, and we were drafted into it by funerals and flag-draped coffins, our innocence blown like, like brain matter and blood on the lap of a pink dress, while German shepherds and fire hoses tore at black men and women billy-clubbed on their knees. Altamont gave us sympathy for the devil. We were lost for a decade of post-traumatic stress, booze and pills, window pane and crystal powders we called thrills. Kicks were getting harder to find. The older we got, out in the woods, we ran on mountaintops. We flew outside up high, fishing lakes, walking streams, searching for something, some reason to breathe to keep stumbling along. What saved me was fatherhood. My kids helped me remember what it was like to see the world up close for the first time, sitting with bees or deer until they didn't care we were there, watching the shadows change from sunset to dark, listening to the old dog snore under our feet, then beat homemade fudge, lick the spoon, play board games on the kitchen floor. Back then, when we were kids, we were convinced our parents knew everything, unaware of their panic, never privy to their terror. My sons reminded me to buck up and be the dad they needed me to be. It's what we do when we don't know what else to do. Pretend. We know what's coming up and what's going down, that road we've never been on. Take the point and walk into the dark. It's the only thing we can do besides celebrate our nakedness rolling in the grass on a sunny afternoon and laughing at the foolery of our oh-so-certain selves. Take stock in each other. Abide our needs to love and dance and play, what we'd almost forgotten. Dial up that old area code for living today. So that's a poem from In the Weeds. And uh, I may read something else uh, out of here. Uh, I read one, I think, last week. But I thought I would just kind of backtrack. And uh, I mean, there's a bunch of poems. Uh, <laughs> to read, and I don't know what to read, so one of the things I thought of was uh, just kind of taking you on a bit of a tour. This, uh, this book uh, is the first book that I had published by uh, a poet and a friend of mine, uh, James J. and this poem is for James, for Jimbo. Uh, I met him in graduate school at the University of Montana, and he wanted to be a publisher. Besides, he's a hell of a poet. But so he asked me if I'd be interested, and then just like, well, of course I'm interested. Yes, I would love to. So this poem is in uh, Connemara Moonshine, is the title of this book. It's out of print. There are a few copies around. Uh, mass hysteria. At 20, I believed anyone who didn't agree with me about Marx, Karl, or Groucho was a humorless, money-grubbing bastard. I measured the world by blisters and shit-eating grins. My conclusion? Workers of the world unite. Raise your eyebrows and duck walk in cycles. You work it too much for too little pay. Turn some serious dough into funny money. Don't join the circus to tame the clowns. Never trade the sunrise for a real estate tip. At 30, I became a father, grist for the mill, let go of the communist manifesto, 
traded my ideals for a washer and dryer, health insurance, the deluded assurance of a savings account. I learned to live every day, every hour for tomorrow. It was no laughing matter. I thought, what did I know? In Moscow, Marxists were eating their dogs, and a B-movie clown told jokes in the White House. I drank and worked overtime. At 40, I barely survived my father's death, exhumed his radical heart, the one he inherited from his wobbly old man, a hand-me-down black and tan doodle heart, years in the mines and whiskey couldn't kill, the comedy of it all. Economics, revolution, utopian dreams. Are we molded more by our stories or our genes? We work, we laugh, we cry, we eat, we drink, we screw, we die. Talking all the time. Systems are random and chaos a pattern. Feed the huddled masses duck soup. At 50, will I wear my trousers rolled? Will my children scold me for singing out loud and squandering their college tuition on a day at the races? Give me a farce, two tickets to paradise. We'll party until it's time. You grow old, you grow cold as proletarian dreams. You grow bold at the promise your shadow will lengthen. Tonight the arias, tonight at the opera, it's all horse feathers. The tenor of the troupe is fat. The king snores through an aria. Our queen loses her dress. Fuck it, the business of debt. So, there you go, true confessions. Obviously, I'm a, I'm a, a leftist at heart. Uh, I'll read this and, and uh, another kind of uh, sort of contemplation, I guess, of, of here. You know, when I was uh, uh, in my early, when I was younger and starting out with a family and even before that, a whole bunch of my friends were departing. They, they were getting out of here. They were going to find a job and better work because it, it wasn't too good. And uh, for some reason, uh, I never ever wanted to, uh, to do that. And so I tried to think about that and it kind of wound up sort of in a poem. This is a two-part poem. It's called In the Blood. Waving beside the mullen Spindly scarecrows of the borrow pit and shale cut slopes. Cattails beckon me, cattails beckon me like fingers to settle with red wing blackbirds rocking on stalks green from rain. Billowing clouds hang low, white, black, gray, curling wispy as an old man's beard, perhaps my father's, gone now seven years. Have these shadowed blue mountains put a spell on me? All I know I don't understand. The cottonwood grove on the nine-mile oxbow. A coyote pausing at the edge of the road and smiling before padding up the draw. These nesting swallows that pop from the clay cut bank. Somehow this ground inhabits me. For no reason I refuse to leave like the ponderosa snapped off at its trunk. No wind, no storm can drive me away from this place I call my journey. My grandfathers crossed an ocean, a continent, to settle this land of rattlesnakes, sagebrush, and snow. What was it that drew them and snuffed wanderlust in one generation? Maybe the endless fields freckled by sweet wildflowers, low ceiling of sky, abundance of water? Could it have been the blackness of moonless nights, a reflection of their immigrant souls? For some time I have told myself I am comfortable with these mysteries, the lion on my porch, raccoons in my yard, and 
decapitated house cats littering the alley. All my stories are here. Why do I think if I left, I would leave them behind as if I could lose dirt and memory like luggage? When I'm alone, I hear voices whisper. I'm afraid of losing my grip. Two. Right now I float the Clark Fork, climb plateau in my mind, follow the game trail that leads me up Gobbler's Knob and back to the pact I made with the deer. My hands covered with his blood, slippery and hot, I worked the knife inside his chest, cut free the entrails and claimed his bones. Before I was through, his agate black eye faded milky gray-blue. I cannot shake it, my pledge to a dead deer. Like my dad's ashes I poured into this ground, I need this story to haunt my dreams, to explain in words what I can't, my attachments to dirt and blood and ghosts. The buttercups and arrowleaf balsam root, dewy on the rocky hillside, wood smoke hovering in a stand of lodgepole pine. Cold creek water gulped and swallowed, slaking an August afternoon thirst. Distant gunshots up Faley Basin. The squeaking crunch of snow under my boot sole, followed by silence only broken by blood ringing in my ears. The osprey have returned to their nest. Even they would move on if the river ran dry. Have I become the blood of the deer, tied to a rhythm I cannot name? Stay, stay the course, the buck whispers. We are waiting in the river, your father and me. We are shimmering in the aspen leaves. Listen to our voices, the water and the wind. Close your eyes and you will see. Well, that's probably enough in that. I can't read forever in one of these things. I've got to move on to another one. Uh, this one uh, I will do. I know it, I think, by heart. Uh, it's called Suicide Note. And uh, it, it was something that I wrote in response to uh, discovering that someone had taken their own life and it was under very uh, sad circumstances that they did that. Uh, it was just a, the whole thing was just shocking and heartbreaking in so many ways and I didn't know how to deal with it. And so I tried to deal with it by, uh, by writing words down on a page it's called Suicide Note. I am slick bare grass on an alpine slope, the talons of a red-tailed hawk. I am cottonwood bark floating in an eddy, a double rainbow over Flathead Lake. I am cool granite skin, the raven's caw, a mist on Marias Pass. I am comets, the moon, my father's ash. I am bloody, the swatted mosquito. I am frost and dust, a gravel road, the embers of a forest fire. I am fresh turned dirt in the April sun. I am the reason you fear the dark. I am licorice, baby, and whiskey breath. I am leather, iron, sweat. I am cinnamon toast and whispering voices that hiss, there is no forgiveness. I am music that puts you on the kitchen floor of the house where you were born. I am Christ, Hitler, Blackie Marquette, buttercups, sauerkraut, and beer. I am chemotherapy, cockleburs on socks, sunrise over the mission range. I am the bones of pottery and thunder. I am wind blowing in stone. I'm changing my name to plastic, cold as my blood, clear 
as a storm. Well, let's move on to another, uh, another uh, place. Uh, for many years, uh, uh, I paid the rent and, and that kind of thing by working for a moving company and driving a truck. And uh, so I, you know, quite a few poems uh, came out of that experience. And uh, this is one. It's for my dad. And it's called Back Into Rock. The full moon rolls over Washington wheat fields, an eye watches and an ear listens to the humming of the Cummins diesel. The revolution of 18 wheels, I rain down Route 174, a no-shoulder two-lane that pours into the Columbia Basin. Rimrock sings an epic I try to imagine. Lost in the glare of the setting sun on my bug-splashed windshield, the white-tailed buck in velvet springs from the cut-slope shade, hesitates, then leaps to catch his death, the killing I came to do. He flies, legs akimbo, up and away, back into rock, like some cartoon Bambi on ice. A deer ball swatted over the left field fence. The fiberglass hood popped and flopping, no way and nowhere to stop. I watch the gauges, hope the radiator's fine. In my mind, the deer is still flying, climbing like that red-tailed hawk unfurling this morning over my passenger side fender like a blanket on a clothesline, gusted by wind. It lifted from the barbed wire fence to warn me, think fast, it's coming, something is following you like your father's silence and thinning bones. I stop at the bottom of the hill, step down from the cab to inspect the grill. One headlight and blinker are broken. The driver's side fender is cracked. Fracture lines whiskered with dun-colored hair trace a scar on the tractor's thigh. As I refasten the hood, the absence of blood makes me wonder if the little heart died. Thirty tons of steel at sixty miles per hour. I shiver, pissing between the duels, and breathe the cool smells of evening on the river, evergreens, water, sage. As I circle the truck, it feels good to walk. The sky is clear, daylight's fading. Soon the moon will rise. I climb back in the tractor and drive one-eyed into night. The deer tells me to trust the moonlight. My old man nods his approval. Pay attention to the shadows, what's on the ground, and keep your eyes on the goddamn road. A lot of poems come out of, I mean, almost everything that I do, I guess, comes out of some kind of experience, whether it's, you know, written or art experience or whatever. Uh, this poem, uh, I was teaching uh, for the Montana Arts Council, I guess, and uh, uh, you know, teaching poetry in schools around the state, and uh, this was back. Uh, well, it'll all take care of itself. It's a narrative poem, so it's called "For Christ's Sake." It's in two parts. I remember when I was ten, running home again, crying after being held down and whitewashed by the bully next door. My mother had heard it too many times before, pointed me toward the bedroom. Go talk to your dad. Ashamed and afraid, I didn't move, so she walked me 
guiding my shoulders. Lying in bed, bare-chested, in the dim glow of yellow light, my father read a cigarette burning in the ashtray. He looked at me, then her, put aside his book, took a drag before butting the smoke. She left, and I stared at my shoes, tried to steady, shuddery breath. When he asked, what's the matter? I bawled out the scene, erupted like a thunderstorm, rained on the floor. He plucked a couple of tissues from the box on the headboard, held them out for me. Here, you'd better blow your nose. I dabbed in blue, wadded the wet Kleenex. He took off his glasses, rubbed his chin. Aren't you getting tired of this? Yes, I keened. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. He's bigger than me. Yeah, that's true. But he won't stop until you make him. Just one good lick is all it takes, and he'll think twice about picking on you. I nodded, grinned, blinked away tears. My father winked good night, and I knew it was. Back in bed, I rehearsed my death, relished the bloody surprise, my answering fists slashing, lashing out at the panicked clown hiding in the bully's eyes. Two, I am working in Shelby, Montana, when Littleton, Colorado goes down. Watch it played out on the TV news, alone in my motel room. The bloodbath viewed on security tapes. When I call home, my son answers the phone. It's good to hear his voice, to know I needn't worry, imagine the worst burying him today. He tells me some kid got beat up in the park across from his school for calling this hick a fag. He swears these homophobic bullies brag about hating queers, says they beat up a girl on the street last week because she's a lesbian. My son is ready to kill the bastards and I want to help him kick some ass. On TV, SWAT teams are still finding bodies, rifling through Columbine. Somebody needs to call the principal, the police, or their goddamn parents, I insist. My son doesn't believe the cops can help. I try to convince him, myself. We're evolving, becoming kinder, yet we keep on killing Cain in the name of Christ. For the love of Jesus, does it make sense to you? Peace, forgiveness, turn your cheek, lay down your life for love. The trench coat mafia bleeds on the stairs, the cafeteria floor. I tell my son to let it go. I don't know what a coward is. I do know a cornered animal is dangerous. I've been there, ready to kill. There's nothing more volatile than the smoldering fire inside a humiliated man. So, uh, how about tell? This is. I'll move on to something else. This is the, sort of the last thing here. It's a little bit less uh, heavy duty, maybe. I don't know. I think all of these kind of are whatever they are. Um, this was a, a poem uh, I dedicated to uh, my good friend Dave Thomas, uh, a poet you'll get the chance to hear on this program. Uh, and he has got a particular style. It's really spare. Uh, formally, it's very. Uh, uh, sort of Eastern uh, in its uh, line length. And uh, anyway, this poem is called Watch the Watch is for Dave. And here it is, and here's the trick. 
and here's the score. Listen to the admin, the voice of God. Listen to the television. Watch the internet spin. My fellow Americans, pray. In God we trust. You're getting sleepy, sleepy. Set your alarm. Go to work and spend, spend, spend. Work and spend. You're getting sleepy, sleepy. Watch the watch. Love to spend, my friends. Keep working, spending. Let freedom ring. That's good. That's right. That's a good, good life. Spend your life working till you die. And there it is. And there you have it. And there you go. <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> nice to th nice, it's nice to laugh at your own jokes or to think you're funny, I guess. I'm quite impressed with my own sense of humor. Uh, this is the first uh, a collection of poems that I had published by uh, a publisher back east that came out here uh, to, to find Montana poets. And uh, Foothills Publishing uh, have done four books for me. And uh, I love these little uh, books. They're, uh, they're, they're not quite as small as the old City Lights books, uh, but you can almost put them in your back pocket. I love the stitch binding on it, and the, just it's a real grassroots press. And uh, I'm right now editing the Montana Poet Series for Foothills Publishing, so uh, uh, I, and I think I will be continuing to do that. So I'll be always on the lookout for for poets in Montana that haven't been included in the series, and uh, some of them you'll be you'll be ch get get the chance to hear uh, on this program. The first poem here uh, was dedicated to a friend of mine's father uh, and, and my son Cash. It's called On the Trail. Four score and four, a good run, and the good son tramps behind, dogging the old man's heels to that camp and the fire built against the night, to the bedroll that invites tired bones to lie down and listen, watch the dying embers fade to crackling heat and shadow, then fall into the deep sleep his body needs so sound there's no memory of a dream. This is the title poem of this book, and uh, So I think I'll read it. Forgotten Dreams. Uh, there's several refer references to Jack Kerouac, I guess. I mean, he was one of the Kerouac and, and all those beat poets because they were, you know, hip and they were, uh, they, were, uh, they were not of the canon, so to speak. They were outside of things. And they spoke uh, in the vernacular and and they dealt with more working class sort of issues that I think resonated uh, with me. So I mean, I, I read all of those guys, and and uh, Kerouac has made a uh, an impression uh, on my own literary life, I guess. Forgotten dreams. Kerouac poses some wine beat moment of poetic genius. His postcard portrayal of a plaid shirt Jesus tacked up beside Bukowski hugging a whore. On my desk is the emptied half pint of Patty, Jimbo's Irish rebel jar of the cosmic eternity, stuffed with dirt, peat, twigs, grass, yates, sand, and whiskey, lifeblood of the old sod cozied up to an Atlantic coast clamshell. Mementos all from vagabond friends, like the photo of the swan beating his wings, standing on the duck farm pond. This day, too, is a gift. 
two inches of fresh snow silencing our post-Easter spring. A white-tailed doe nibbles pussy willows in the yard. I shrug soreness from my shoulders, note wrinkles in the mirror, gray hair in my beard. Isn't it weird to be here the longer you're here and aware you won't be here much longer? I found the rock sitting on my windowsill 30 years ago up Pebble Creek. Kept it because it looked like a brain, actually half one hemisphere, porous, lobed, and pitted. I notice a piece of quartz embedded in the cortex, reminding me of Tony's tumor. Rumor has it death is lurking for this sweet-hearted lad who is a kid and a man and a husband and a dad. God damn it, all to hell, anyway. I scan the rock, turn it slowly in my hands. All I see is stone, hard, rough, mysterious, like cancer. Life is a distraction on death row. Am I missing something besides faith? Is there a lesson, some healing secret or grail buried deep underground? Don't ask me. Christ promises all will be revealed. So we'll see with the sleeper's closed eyes, if we're more than forgotten dreams. And then there's this. I, uh, there was reference to... Uh, Charles Bukowski, who was kind of an extension of that beat uh, generation of poets. He was published, I think, by City Lights. Um, but, you know, I, Bukowski, is, a lot of people poo-pooed Bukowski. Uh, I think he's probably sold more collections of poetry than anybody, to be honest. And, uh, of course, I get to that in this little tribute. But I, I wrote like him a lot, I thought, for a long time. And I thought, geez, you're just doing copycat work on Bukowski. And, uh, and that, to an extent, that's true. I think all, all of us, when we're young, start out, you know, because we like somebody and we tend to write like them. At the same time, I also think that uh, I think we just thought a lot alike. And I mean, I liked his work and I felt the same way and uh, about a lot of issues. And, uh, and, of course, alcohol has played a, a role in my life, and uh, it certainly played one in Bukowski's. This is called Smoke, and that's who it was written for. Believe me, I don't care about the awards, the prizes, or the editor's choice in those literary magazines that claim to know everything worth saying about an excerpted line from an academic avant-garde hip-hop protege working at the height of his or her powers. A head-banging nod away from their mentor's fresh push of the language a decade ago, documented in a first edition essay. Fuck that. I'd rather have Bukowski's culled poems scraped up as new 15 years after he's fed the worms because he didn't try to extend the language. He merely sang from the core, that hole that exists inside us all, that void we call heart. His hole, a flop house, wine bottle, toast and eggs heart, a shit stall at the track, open and ready for a steaming crap, or some whore turned roommate rolling to bird on the phonograph in the glazed sheets of his beer-stained fart sack. Nothing pretty, nothing proud, nothing glitzy or new. He sang like a bluebird on the roof of a burning house, and that's why he's read today. That's why his books continue to sell. 
A bluebird doesn't try to impress you. You can't explain what a bluebird says. It just is. It does. It bleeds and sings like fire burns and humans love to judge, to critique, to play follow the leader and praise and pan and pose in the balcony, in the lobby, over dinner and wine in crystal glasses with linen napkins in their laps. The bluebird knows all the world's a stage. It still sings when the house is burning down. Bluebirds don't try, don't pay to be considered for a bird song prize. What they do is sing and fly. Believe me, pages turn, fires burn, and bluebirds die. One of the things, uh, you know, growing up in Montana, I mean, uh, in a little dinky town, I grew up in Alberton, uh, and, uh, and of course, you know, we all, uh, for the fun of it, I mean, that was what we did for entertainment, uh, the boys anyway, the, the girls, I don't know, you know, they, they got screwed uh, as they did, and they all, well, that, there, there you go, chuckles. Uh, they, uh, they didn't have any athletic activity, and, uh, and, and back in that time when I was in school, you see the result of, of, of what Title IX has done now, right? I mean, I look, at these, I look at these college women and these professional female athletes, whether it's tennis or track or whatever it may be, and they are, they are incredible. But, you know, I mean, it took, a, it took a while to get to this position simply because they didn't have the opportunity. And, uh, and we did as kids, we, as men, you know, real men, we, we had the opportunity to play football and basketball and all those kinds of sports activities. So I played a lot of football, I played a lot of basketball and, uh, until I was in my 40s. I just liked it. It was a game. It was fun. And one of my favorite memories of, of watching a football game when I was really young was uh, something that was called the Ice Bowl. It was a, a championship, NFL championship game between uh, the Green Bay Packers and the Dallas Cowboys. And uh, so uh, a guard uh, who was instrumental in the Packers' victory in that uh, football game, the guard's name was Jerry Kramer. And uh, just so happens that Jerry Kramer was born and raised in Jordan, Montana. And uh, so here we go. This title of this little poem is After Jerry Kramer. To be there in that moment, blood and sweat freezing to skin, elbows and shins bruised, swollen, the turf hard as stone. You crouching, feet measured by feet right and left, legs spread shoulder width, twisting cleats digging in, finding that bite, then dropping to position chest parallel to the ground, head up, butt down, weight evenly distributed in the three-point stance, fingers and knuckles numb, eyes level, focused, unwavering, knowing this is your time and showing nothing, neither the halt nor the leap in your heartbeat as the mountain in front of you moves where you want it to go, gives you the angle, the leverage you need to explode at the snap, create that gap for the stars to shine on blue collar guys, those unshaven fat asses buried in the trenches, the insignificant nameless freaks, the ones who up until this moment the image of your block were but the obscure Zen monks of football. Go, Jerry. <laughs> for, all, for those of you out there that, uh, that actually played some football and were on the line, you can truly relate to that. <laughs> Yeah.
I'll read this. Uh, I had the uh, pleasure of, uh, of being present uh, in a hospice situation for my mother's passing. And it didn't take all that long, a few weeks, but uh, a month or so, I suppose. Anyway, this is a this is a poem. I uh, one night I stayed I spent you know over there with her, and so I was there one night, and and uh, this just popped out uh, in her living room. It's called Another Mother Night. Three yellow tulips and a dying red rose, ceramic bunnies and dinosaurs, Felix the cat. I love Lucy. The History of Beaverhead County, William O. Douglas, Harry S. Truman, Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt, Pabst Blue Ribbon, Folgers in the Can, A Sunbeam Toaster, The Stack of Reader's Digests, and I listen for the whistling rattle of morphine breath. From the hospital bed, we moved in to replace the double she'd slept in all those years, staring at the ceiling and listening for his return. What's left of fern in the dead of night? In the daylight, though nauseous and drowning in her own fluids, she is holding court and cracking wise about getting to the other side. Her sister, her craps, her pain, everything. Like the three-fingered shot glass Vinnie would have loved. Surrounded by her family, she's still trying to ease and entertain. Determined to feed, to empty the refrigerator, her work of 70 years. I hear that rhythmic snore through the bedroom door that takes me back to that Alberton railroad shack. A comforting sound I know I'll hear again when I'm under the covers of my own deathbed and searching for my mom and dad, those ahead. If I'm lucky, there will be a red rose that hangs on for me and someone who plants yellow tulips, maybe two or three, in a bed of April sun. Someone who will remember who will honor my mother in me. If God is love, I am full of God. She'd drink to that. As I said, I grew up in Alberton, which was a Milwaukee railroad town. And uh, so a lot of, lot of railroad kind of ideas or imagery tends to, to run through my thinking or my, a lot of my poetry. And, there's a, here's a couple along those lines. This is called Graveyard Shift. Lying in bed, I listen to the thunder in the distance, boxcars colliding in the rail yard across the river, drumming up the storm, the freight in my head, my dad working the Bonner job, building trains, numbers and orders, day shift or graveyard, his lantern signaling drops and picks, setting up an east or westbound trip, switching in the pouring rain, when every greasy ladder, oil-soaked tie, even the catwalks were slick under boot or mitt, twelve-hour shifts on the trot, heart thumping like a bad rail joint or flat spot on one wheel. The deal is, our lives float by like loose and splintered roadbed ties, dissolving and bobbing in puddles of muddy memory. Lightning flashes remind me of him at 2 a.m., stumbling thunder, broken plates, and the lantern atop my dresser, bread and butter tool of a brakeman who worked around the clock and drank his way out of this world into a country where time became his, a land free of forced labor, just a place where one could be, experience, think, explore, 
and dream of something more than money, some vision of possibility, an existence beyond working men as machines and counting miles, hours, broken knuckles, and bottom lines, a life where people might spend their time tending gardens and each other instead of living like slaves and saving their coins to cover the cost of dying so their children needn't dig their graves. Here's one close to it. Uh, I mentioned Kerouac earlier. Kerouac was a, was a prose writer for the most part. You mean On the Road was his famous uh, book. And, uh, and he wrote a bunch of other uh, novels. Or, uh, but he did write a, a fair amount of poetry. I think the one that we're, most people might be familiar with is called Mexico City Blues, a collection of poems. And each one of those was a chorus. He referred to each one as a chorus. And I, so I stole this title sort of from him. Rose Hill is a place out in Alberton. Uh, the rest of it is just messing around with sound, I guess. Rose Hill Blues, Chorus 52. Funny you should mention them old clickety-clack blues. I've been rolling around with Dr. Sachs, searching for my walking shoes. So it's funny you should mention you got that hobo moan a-going. Because old Master Jack, he cracked them railroad blues stoned, and he spun it for the ding-dang-dung punny fun of it spent his dues, pulled his daisy with bowery bums who dug his high ballin' blues. It's funny how it rattles the panes and slam-bams you to sleep, switching trains, bells and whistles in your black rain dream. Empty bottle in hand, fingers twitching. I'll be damned if it ain't funny how that beat hip trip rolls round again. And the bluesmen join up singing in boxcars, Robert Johnson hymns. Brother, we're all taken for a ride. We're all born to sing a kind of blues. That's why we love trains in the night. That's why we refuse to choose. Just lay down, listen, and snooze. Lose ourselves like kids tucked in on Rose Hill, listening, scheming to hitch and sing, Bobby McGee or maybe Woody Guthrie will set us free as reds in the land of white Kerouacian mimics, tipping back a pint bottle like blue-black runners, powder in the night, and Casey Jones speeding dead at full throttle. My dad uh, and mom came from Beaverhead County. I mean, they went to school down there. Uh, my dad's family came down from Butte and settled down uh, in Dillon, and my mom's family was there uh, in Beaverhead County down in Dillon. So, so there was a, a big connection to that country. We always went down there. I had aunts and uncles down there, and, and, uh, and the Big Hole. Uh, my dad loved the, the Big Hole Valley simply because of, uh, he'd worked up there as a kid and spent a lot of time in that country. Anyway, this is, uh, this is a poem that, uh, we, you know, one of the things that we used to do uh, for entertainment uh, 50 years ago, uh, everybody, I think, almost not about everybody, but anybody that was a, attached to rural Montana life, uh, rodeos were, were like an entertainment that people just went to. You know, I mean, uh, we, we, uh, we went to a lot of rodeos. My dad dug rodeos because of the connection with horses and growing up. And so this, uh, this is a memory that I had, and I just wrote it. And it's dedicated to Benny Reynolds, who, uh, Benny Reynolds was a great uh, Montana rodeo cowboy. And uh, most people uh, my age or uh, uh, older, for sure, uh, uh, know who Benny Reynolds is. The title of this poem is just called The Kid. It didn't seem fair to the horse trying to buck him off, Benny's feet almost dragging in the arena dirt. Literally, he was larger than life for this butch-waxed popcorn muncher sporting four-inch rolled-up cuffs on his husky jeans. 
Benny Reynolds ruled the day all around at the Powell County Rodeo. Steer wrestling, bull riding, saddle bronc and bareback, he dwarfed the stock, made it look too easy. And since the old man had wrangled horses in the big hole with Johnny, Benny's older brother, he took me behind the chutes with him when he went to congratulate the kid and check in with the Melrose boys. Of course I did and didn't want to go. I felt embarrassed, unworthy of meeting someone like that, somebody of mythic stature, a king, the Superman of Montana Rodeo. I hung back a step behind my dad, peeked around him, felt my face go red when Benny's eyes caught mine and he smiled at me. John waved us in and offered my dad a beer. Benny sat on the open tailgate of the pickup truck, stuck out a huge paw the size of my baseball mitt and shook the old man's hand. He was all angles under that black cowboy hat and those arching eyebrows, big boned, long armed and legged, even long jawed. But all those oversized features seemed necessary to support his huge grin when my dad kidded him about drawing all nags. He blushed shockingly shy as me and nodded his head, stole glances at the crew cut little fat kid while Johnny and the old man sipped on Great Falls Select and reminisced about names I didn't know and days working on hay rakes and beaver slides. Benny was quiet. He listened and smiled he did remind me of a kid in a giant's body. He was what every child hopes a hero will be. Gentle, kind, all modesty, humility, and strength. Possessing superhuman abilities, yet capable of calming a panicked colt or scratching a half-feral barn cat behind the ears before putting out the lights each starry big sky night, then snuggling in to his mama's arms. As you can see, uh, these need no introduction. At my first lesbian wedding, the clip-on yellow submarine style John Lennon shades found in the jockey box of my mother's car after she died, provided the cover I needed to hide the streams of tears I shed, watching the likes of these two young lovers professing and celebrating their promise to care for one another in front of their families today, and for the life-till-death commitment of their sisters and brothers, that full-on, crazy-ass family of friends who dance and sing down the aisle, behind them, Mardi Gras style, under a ceiling of bright blue sky. The aisle being that parting of the crowd, those gathered witnesses for these twinned hearts need to proclaim their decision to walk hand in hand to the end of the line, that beginning we don't understand. So they do it. They cheer, they dance and sing, they kiss, celebrate this thing, this vow, this marriage, a pact to sail stormy seas together, weather close quarters, sirens and morning breath, all hungers, temptations, tempests and thirsts. Those old desires to jump ship and party every port. We toast the dream to make this moment last. Hold on to the happiness of these love-struck fools, the parade of hoots and smiles, the hugs and laughs. Now that the service is history and my first lesbian wedding is in the books. When I look at the vineless trellis, now standing alone in the meadow, a homemade latticework archway of sorts, 
hung with sheer curtains and made for the last outdoor family affair, a cousin's Christian marriage, guarded and guided by traditions and rules. I see how it provided a backdrop, a focal point, an opening, a frame. Call it a door or whatever illusion we choose to see or ignore. Help us to enter and write our, an old new story, one we can follow back and forward for thousands of years. And still the breeze wafts the transparent linens lightly as it tousled the bride's blonde curls earlier when she stood before us and kissed her bride, and I leaked beneath the waves of this green sea, happily grinning in my yellow submarine. And I believed, because that's the way it seemed to me, God was busy as usual, just letting things be. Well, uh, last one. This is a short little poem called Negative Canon. Canon as being the poetic literary canon. Think of it. All the great poems we will never read, the uncollected gems no one tried to publish, or those groundbreaking verses submitted to fall on ears that couldn't hear their music or genius, since no one had ever written it before, smiled at or applauded the blue, discomforting new, odd aberrations evoking miraculous celebrations that grew into the norm of the comfortable few, those modern, post-wandering, spontaneous rang foo we now crave, that anxious reach of ghostly poems, so edgy honest in their silence and loss, guaranteed to be packing their necessary form, the unsaid, the beautiful, the queer, a poem. So, uh, there's a sample, uh, a, a whole hell of a long sample, of, uh, of what I am up to half the time when I'm scribbling my uh, thoughts down on the page. And uh, as I said, I, I think you will enjoy all of the poets that I contact across the state. Uh, and that's where we'll be headed uh, next week in this endeavor. So please join us in, uh, if you're a fan of poetry. Thanks. Thank you.